Here we go. Hey everybody, happy Saturday. Welcome to the Do It Live podcast. I'm Jeffrey. If y'all haven't met me, it's nice to meet you. Um, I do not have any official co-host today, so here we go. Um, this is my first time hosting a podcast and with this many people, it's really exciting to develop and refine these skills with everybody. So I'm a little bit behind the course schedule. I started listening to the lecture last night, but the last one that I officially listened to was the week eight. Um, and it was pretty monumental for me. All the sales stuff is really exciting and new, and it's fun to be in the real world exploring those things. Um, I did really like the idea of getting in there and doing the calls the uh, blueprint calls and practicing those I haven't had the opportunity to do that but I'm looking forward to getting in there and doing that I know a couple people have and we're going to talk to Jonathan about his experience later a little bit later um, I want to go back to the um, lecture from last Friday the week eight and share a little bit of what felt really awesome for me with that so yeah, I'm going to pull up the PDF. So I really identified with the planning and action aspects. Um, I have found myself in numerous situations where I felt like I had a vague idea of what I wanted to do, but I didn't have an official plan. And I sort of did fall um, on my face a couple of times, had a couple of failures with our farm startup and trying to do it full time, but not being exactly capable, not having the space, maybe reality was different than my perception. Um, and I feel that this particular slide and the conversation that happened around this, where there's a little bit longer of a free fall really softened the blow. Um, I remember in a lecture a couple of weeks ago when we watched the Dan Locke video, on the where he was wearing the red suit and he talked about you have to jump off at some point and the only thing that's going to be different is how hard or soft the landing is or if you fall uh, are able to fly and this slide and conversation really um cemented some of that in and, and really expanded upon that idea does anybody want to comment on their experience in the past with planning and business planning and how maybe this these ideas have changed since we've done some of the lectures and been going through this program. Yeah, I'll speak to it. Um, what's up, Jeffrey? Hey, TJ. Good to see you hosting. It's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, so as far as uh, planning and action, I mean, yeah, it's key. Um, but yeah, so I had tons of uh, ideas and plans prior to um, autonomy and, um, yeah, this has really put things in perspective. And uh, now I got like three projects going on and, uh, yeah, I mean, planning and uh, putting them into my calendar and chipping away at them uh, bit by bit. Um, it, uh, I think it's really essential to just kind of bring it, hone it in and like realize it's, it's kind of just that simple when you really think about it. Um, you just kind of take one idea and you focus on it and you start, you know, putting aspects of that in your calendar and just start chipping away at it a little bit or bit by bit. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting to me that like, uh, a lot of us don't even think about it in that, uh, aspect until it's pointed out to us, but, um, just a simple slide like that. And the way Richard puts it out there, I think is, uh, uh, really beneficial and it's really benefited me so far in autonomy. Did you have any experience with putting stuff like that in calendars before and, and giving yourself deadlines and working on those ideas? 
not in my personal endeavors. So I've had that experience in like in my job, but uh, as far as my personal endeavors is just, I was always a chaotic mess. I mean, I had a lot of things that I wanted to do and I wanted to pursue, but um, actually getting them done. I always laugh and tell people in my interviews and stuff. I always like, Oh, I got this, this thing I want to do and I'm confident I'll get it done. But I always like tend to, I'll be like, I'll get it done in six weeks. And it ends up taking me six months, you know? So, (laughs) so, um, yeah, I mean, like at work, that's kind of part of my job, but um, I didn't, yeah, I mean, transfer that over into my personal endeavors, which is exactly what I want to do. I mean, per se, as far as, uh, yeah, I mean, getting out of that, that corporate mindset and job, you know, but I just never applied it in my own personal endeavors. So yeah, like, uh, I really utilize my time now, like outside of work and I have very minimal time, but by popping things in my calendar and, yeah, you know, I mean, planning ahead and actually, uh, putting a goal, um, behind like with my property and stuff like instead of before it was just kind of up in the air i would just go up there and kind of wander around and figure out what i was going to do next now i have goals i mean now i have like uh i need to get my well done i need to get my subject done i mean like so that's kind of how i'm approaching it you know so like last time it was like go up there with the bobcat knock down some trees and clear out the spacing for my home site so that was the goal so that's what i did i went up there and i knocked it out and it's done so now my next goal is going to be, you know, I mean, is going to be clearing out uh, some of that stuff uh, so I can uh, schedule the, the, the well, you know, so like um, I'm shipping away at it now to where like I had three months prior to where I was just kind of wa- wandering around up there kind of trying to figure out what I was going to do next. So and uh, the conversation I had with Justin Olson in the beginning of autonomy kind of helped me in that aspect. So, yeah. How does it feel? now when you look back at your uh past self going up to a property because the property is overwhelming you're like getting to know a new space and you can you know i find that i can personally walk around a quarter acre that i've started in the garden and i can spend hours in there finding new things to look at and you know so the bigger you get the more nuance and things you can get how do you feel now looking back at that where you were kind of wandering there looking things and now you're developing the plan have you noticed um a difference in the way that you're structuring your visits up there and what more things are coming up oh absolutely absolutely 100 percent. i mean yeah so that's that's the key word right there is uh structuring my my time up there because it's a it's a fair distance away from where i live currently so yeah it's i mean like going up there like i said prior is like having that that goal of accomplishment. It's just like having a meeting. Yeah. It's like, I always say like, like I have a lot of meetings at work and a lot of them are pointless because yeah, I mean, you walk into a meeting and it's just, it's just chitter chatter. You know, there's like, if I, if I hold a meeting, I host the meeting. Uh, like we, we, we talk about it and then I go around the room at the end of it and make sure everybody's clear on the objective of the meeting. Yeah. I mean, everybody has an understanding of what the, the overall outcome of that goal was like, they even have the meeting. You know, so like I said before, like it's it's like I used to do that stuff at work, but I never applied it in my own my own endeavors. So now I'm applying that in my own endeavors, and it, yeah, it's very fulfilling and it's uh, it's amazing. Like uh, I got I got more done in two visits since I've been in autonomy than I did in the prior three months. So yeah, it's awesome. And like you said, yeah, like it's funny. So I I went up there with a bobcat and I knocked down a bunch of trees and I cleared out a bunch of space and all this stuff and I had the, and I I did it. But then <clears throat> after. Uh, like on uh, Sunday before I was going to leave me and Jackson, my son, we walked to the back of the property and I was like, Oh my God, I was like, I got four more acres basically back here. I was like, there's so much that can be done. So it's, it's very exciting. It can be overwhelming at times. Um, just like, yeah. I mean, Cause you're like, Whoa. But at the same token, like um, when you're, when you're chipping at a task uh, one action at a time, so to speak, um, and you can see that progress and you can look back and see like that you've, what you've accomplished or what I, yeah, I mean, like there, it's so much more fulfilling and you can you can actually feel and um yeah, i mean and experience that progress and it's yeah it's it's 100 times better than the where i was at prior like when i was going up there kind of just drifting so to speak <laughs> awesome anybody else want to hop in and talk about planning and what that's done for them <laughs> I suppose, Jeffrey, it's one of the biggest realizations that uh, I know I need to do. It's probably my biggest failing that my calendar is is full with work from uh, when I start in the morning to when I'm uh, logging off too late in the evening. But uh, I'm just not doing it for myself. And uh, TJ then just so eloquently put it forward that unless you're actually chipping away at your personal goals and what your, your personal project plans are, 
you, you're not going to get it done. So that was actually the light bulb moment for me. Um, and it's the whereabouts actually I've, I've probably uh, felt bad about my own personal integrity that I haven't been uh, doing that uh, enough. So, yeah, if anybody else is out there like myself who was uh, scheduled, you know, nine to six on or eight to six on Monday to Friday, but then left your weekends blank. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely out there and, and failing. So that's probably the, the biggest quick win that uh, for the epiphany moment for me that I can start to do is, yeah. And, and that scheduling in goals and stuff for my girls and uh, family time as well. Yeah, I can really identify with that scheduling the family time. It feels like it's really easy, especially working and being at home a lot more, more frequently than some maybe, and being aware. And it's so easy to get caught up in things and responding to child emergencies, as I like to call them and uh, <laughs> the things that are happening that it's like, oh, we didn't really just hang out and do stuff that everybody's having a good time. We're just kind of sometimes interacting only on that, uh, on that space of like, stop wrestling with your sister and hurting her. And, all, you know, nobody should be throwing scissors and things like that. So uh, it's really important. We've kind of decided to start uh, looking at what day makes the most sense for us to really s schedule out big chunks of time and being able to do that. Yeah, that's brilliant. It, it's such a, a simple thing. And uh, it's uh, amazing how you think this little bit of effort, even just scheduling what you're going to be doing for your, your meals in advance, scheduling what you're going to be doing on Saturday and, and Sunday afternoons and the, the like, it just takes up so much stress and anxiety from you from when the uh, the time goes around. I can tell it, it is one of the baggage items that I've carried with me for a very long time from my 15,000 hours of schooling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've never been good at scheduling for the longest time. It was, I don't even, I think that uh, Nina, my wife had been talking to me about coming up with daily schedules and rhythms for the children for five years or something. And, you know, I was like, oh yeah, that's a little bit too rigid for me. And that's a little bit too, and I still don't like blocking in every moment of every day because I like the opportunity for spontaneity. But when there's nothing, when it's just complete chaos, it's, it's the other end of the spectrum. You can just not get anything done because you're only living in that space. I like that you brought up the fact of like you like some spot annuity in, in, in there because like I kind of struggled with that in the beginning of this, like because um, I do. I, I love I love spot annuity. I love spontaneous things like it's it's thrilling and it's it's also just like uh, I think it's part of our life experience. You know, I mean, to just kind of like go with the flow in certain aspects. But I mean, to, to do that wholeheartedly 100 percent of the time. Yeah, it's just chaotic and it's it's uh, really hard to hone in and, and uh, really uh, chip away at your goals. But I appreciate that you brought that up because I, uh, that resonates with me because I'm, I'm the same mindset as that. So I kind of try to leave some room for that no matter what, you know, it's just like, it's like, it's almost like those gaps in your schedule now. It's like, it's like your spot annuity schedule, so to speak, you know, it's just like, but you still got to hone in and make sure you're focusing on those, uh, those goals and, you know, I mean, trying to do your best to get them done. Yeah, and I really find that working with the David Allen stuff has uh, kind of increased the spontaneity fulfillment meter. Oftentimes my spontaneity, like gaps in the schedule or when I'm driving, were kind of like filled with things that weren't exactly nourishing or uh, investments of times. They were distractions. Um, and, you know, I still have some relationships with old friends that every once in a while when I'm driving and I don't have anything to do, I'll call them first just to check in. And I've been finding a lot of times where we're just sitting on these surface level things for too long and it's hard to get off. And that spontaneity is even being eaten up. Um, so I really like where David Allen is talking about how getting as much of this stuff out of your mind is able to, when you do have those moments of unscheduled time, you can intuitively make a better decision about what's the most important thing or what do I want to do right now? And I feel like that's really been illuminated for me and able to, the more I get out, the more that those spontaneous, out of my head, the more ideas, the more things that I'm able to get out of that space, that mental RAM space that he says, the more I am able to act in the moment and have better things, um, better interactions, better choices. And speaking of 
distraction, unless anybody else has something to go on, I want to share one of my other favorite moments from last week. So I really enjoyed um, this distraction is the only luxury of the poor conversation and um, that the only extravagance that poor people enjoy is spending enormous amount of time on trivial activities. And this is going back to what I was just saying is uh, I feel like a lot of the times when I had those free schedules or not free schedules, I don't feel like I ever actually have uh, free time. I'm just less mentally occupied doing a mundane task and I'm able to do a multitask with it in some instances. And I feel like a lot of the times I would choose distraction over um, anything useful, any investments. And that whole thing has been really coming up for me, noticing what's a distraction and what's an investment. And, you know, it's been a long time since I've I feel like the only movie that I've watched movies that I've watched in the last five years are children's movies uh, other than like documentaries that I'm listening to when I'm working or something, but I don't feel like I can even identify with that hanging out watching Netflix all day. And I hear a lot of people talk about it and it just blows my mind that that's going on. Um, so yeah, that's a really big, that was a really impactful thing to realize that that's kind of what people are utilizing as their, their, their spending economy, their attention economy. And it's, it's really intense that that's, that that's going on so much. Yeah, Jeffrey, all those, uh, that distraction, the using of Netflix, the using of uh, Facebook and all the other social medias, it is such a distraction. It's um, from Brave New World. It is really soma for the masses. It is the uh, the opiates now. It's one way that bread and circuses has been so personalized for people. And there's a lot of information and data that's gone into these decisions, you know, these random positive reinforcements they them have really studied for how to make us the product and get us to consume their distractions. It, it's that for me, it, it's quite frightening. Yeah, it is super frightening. I mean, I, uh, I think at the beginning of last night's lecture, Richard mentioned something about the apps on our phone that aren't really useful to us, but they're just mining our data and um, how that's not really a great relationship. And it's, you, you look at it, you know, I have an Android and I was, trying to open something the other day and I accidentally hit the TikTok thing that was that was on there and I didn't I didn't remember it ever installing that and I was shocked that after I accidentally opened it once it was giving me like three notifications a day trying to get me trying to get me in there and uh you know I had to just go in there and uninstall it or I chose to do that but it is shocking how much that stuff is is trying to grab us. And um, there's a whole book about that attention economy that I really enjoyed called How to Do Nothing. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the author, uh, Jenny O'Dell maybe, uh, and it has a lot to do with the attention economy. And she brings to light this, uh, this Greek philosopher, um, and I, I can't remember the name at the moment, but when Caesar, I think, or so there was maybe not Caesar, but there was some king or some, you know, elite person coming to town and everybody was just freaking out, doing all this stuff, trying to get ready. And this guy whose only possession was a bathtub just started furiously moving his bathtub around town um, and just doing all of this stuff. And he would just lay in the bathtub and, and do Dr. Brian it. Mold, the diabetes coach. And I'm so glad that you decided to register. Hey, Danny, I think maybe we got a call coming in. Uh, so yeah, the, 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 the philosopher was just moving his bathtub around and showing people that they're just being distracted. And then finally this elite guy, um, that was just his way of showing people how ridiculous their attention was being diverted. And eventually the elite came to him and the story goes that, uh, the elite asked him something about him being one of the smartest person people. And he just said, excuse me, can you get out of my sunlight? Um, to show how much he didn't care about that attention economy.
anybody else feel that they've had those times of distraction and are able to start seeing that and breaking out of any of those habits? I'm going to jump in and admit that I have not jumped out of the distraction. Um, yeah, I'm just o totally overwhelmed. I'm going to tell you guys that um, I, I really fought the Calendly thing. Like, it really freaked me out that I was going to actually have to schedule time to talk to people every week. And um, I'm kind of easing into that now, but I do book out time. Like, if somebody, a real human being shows up, I actually just book out time with myself because I still haven't figured out how to troubleshoot, you know, do the actual program. Um, and uh, yes, I still distract myself on Netflix. I admit it. I admit it. <laughs> hey, that's a courageous thing to come out and say, you know, and, and I think it's really interesting to be able to notice when we're being distracted. And sometimes it's like, maybe that's what we need is to just like chill out for a minute. I remember in one of the lectures, you know, there was a comment about having to just quit to be able to free your, your mind from, from certain things. And sometimes I have to do that too. It's just like, I need some really dumb stand up comedy or something to just like, I need to listen to some Jeff Foxworthy and for, you know, something super ridiculous and just like reset. Um, and yeah, I think that that's, Okay, I can also identify with the Calendly tool and the struggle with that. I have still yet to really give anybody my Calendly link because I felt overwhelmed at this idea of uh, our schedule being, you know, I'm in autonomy. Nina's in a radical midwifery course. I was working a full-time clock job and we're growing a farm business and we have children. And it was more uh, looking at Discord and seeing like, hey, is anybody, I actually feel like, the capacity to connect is anybody there and it happened a couple of times but often i was just listening to people last week i clicked on justin's to see what he was up to or if we could match up because i wanted to talk to him and i realized he only had one week posted and that was when i realized that you can have no date availability and you could just override like oh i'm going to be available at just this day and that was way less overwhelming to me and and uh that thought process has been a lot more easily assimilated yeah that's true you can go one week at a time or whatever that's really i still honestly for some reason i mean i'm usually pretty good at computer programs and stuff but this one is just really not that easy for me to figure out but um so far it's i'm getting calmer about it now i, I was feeling trapped in the um in the you know idea that I was going to give up four hours a day to, to but then you know it was just like an, a mental trap in my head it wasn't real um, I've also been having a lot of anxiety and stuff come up I don't know why lately so um, um, I've just been uh, zoning out I do do that but I'm not working a regular job right now. I'm living off a settlement from a car accident. And so I do have like a paper calendar. I'm not willing to give that up. And I do have scheduled uh, a, point, a lot of appointments and try to get things done. And, um, but goals, I don't have any real goals really right now. I've like, I came in with this idea that I thought I was gonna do this thing. And now since I've been in here, I'm just like everything, I had to throw everything to the wind for the moment. Is that your, um, were you trying to do something with your artwork? Yeah, I was, that, yeah. Because I remember at the beginning of the course, you had talked about just getting into this farmer's market type or craft vendor yep. in real life thing. And then it kind of just all stopped. Yep. And then just the thought of trying to push that through. I mean, it just was like, it just didn't feel like it was the right thing. And I just felt like I was just going to go through the course and see what, what came up. And I have built two WordPress websites and I'm feeling like um, I want to keep doing that um, to, you know, hone my skills with that. And, um, and then I'm just going to put everything else on the, on the back burner to see what comes up as a result of going through the whole course. That's how I feel. I mean, and like develop assistant support skills like copywriting, uh, web design, 
these are things I've done in the past, but they're old. Like my skills are old from the 80s, 90s. So I have to upgrade them to the digital age now. And um, so, yeah, that's what I've been pretty much doing. But yeah, my artwork, I just want to do it for myself right now. I don't know what happened. Something in autonomy. I don't know. I was just like, I, am I going to really make myself into an art factory? I was like, hell no. It just was too hard. Yeah, and yeah. it felt like it would be like counterproductive to do that. Right, because you're kind of putting it out instead of for the sake of being inspired, it's putting it out for a deadline. And it's yeah. hard to do that for something that feels like a sacred activity, right? Yeah, I mean, I didn't realize that at the time, but but then because what when it was at the fair, it was really easy to do. It was super fun and everything, but to do it online by taking orders and stuff like that. I did find myself um, totally procrastinating on a few that I had for, I'm on Simbi, which is a barter website and I had a few people order them. Um, and I just, you know, totally procrastinated. And I thought, you know what, if this is my business, I can't do that. You know, is this, maybe this isn't really right as a business. So yeah, I just uh, sort of took another look at it. <laughs> Like, you know, I mean, I think Richard had mentioned that selling artwork is a scarce from the scarcity mentality. And I kind of like that idea because um, it's just, it turns it into a product, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's like, but it, but it comes from the heart. It comes from the intuition and it comes from all these things and all these things have to be perfectly aligned in order for it to come out. And then if you start to try to push it, it's just, I mean, I'm like, yeah, it is. This. And then, and then it's like, oh, but I have to put food on the table and then you get it done and then you have to do another one. I mean, you know, I think it is, I think that's true that it's from the scarcity me mentality to try to sell it and have it be like a business. So to try, I, I just thought, well, I'm going to see what else comes up in the course. Has the, has going through the course at brought up any ideas of how to have like a low pressure offer that involves art where you can, you know, have some kind of way to filter people and products that you really align with to be able to do inspiring artwork for things like that. And, and, you know, be that contractor. Well, so far, um, like I said, so far, the, the, the best idea for the moment to me is to do commercial art, like graphic design, like, you know, websites, copywriting, um, video editing, these things, which I've done in the past, um, analog, or obviously not websites, but I mean, I, I do, used to do HTML coding, but now, you know, WordPress is kind of just like uh, moving blocks around. But um, so that, and then, you know, to do the artwork thing more, you know, just like a gift to the universe and see who comes my way. Um, and then, you know, I have so much artwork that people have suggested that I do a book of some kind, which I've thought about that a lot, but I am not inspired at the moment to do how, how to put, I have all the images, but how to put it together. I haven't any idea right now. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm just kind of waiting at the moment. Besides that, I'm just kind of waiting to... <clears throat> to see what else might come come up you know what i mean because like it, maybe someday <clears throat> i don't know maybe someday i will become a content creator of some kind but for right now it seems like um just using my creative skills to be a support to another person who's already established who's in alignment with my ideals is like a uh, fine until I can figure that other thing out. I mean, yeah, there's always the idea, oh, maybe, you know, this is what came on my call, on my call with Richard was like, you know, to do a course uh, in painting, an intuitive painting course. Um, uh, but I, I, again, it's like to do that online bothers me. Like you, you don't get to um, have that energy of the people. I mean, I have taught this course before live and the, there's this huge energy that gets created by all the people together. And that energy 
um, moves all the whole group of people into the next level. And I just don't see how, you know, you could do that digitally. But maybe there's something else that I'm not aware of right now that I could do since I've been an artist for like 45 years or something like that. I'm sure that I have some skills that I'm not aware of that I could make into a course at some point. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can identify with that, um, with that feeling of the way different energy in the real world versus the online world, you know, trying to think about how to develop a course for farming and teaching people something like that has been really challenging for me. Um, and, you know, I was listening to the Grand Theft World podcast this week and hearing all the stuff about Jordan Page's online guitar course has been really challenging. Um, you know, I used to play a lot of guitar and it, it seems overwhelming to me to think about doing that online. And, and, you know, I study a classical Indian instrument now, and there's no way you would get a teacher to teach you that online because of the amount of subtleties and things. And, and so it was really hard for me to wrap my head around that because there is that particular energy in the room. But when they were talking about the idea of people who don't even really want to play the guitar that much, but they just like the way Jordan Page's music makes them feel and that they might come and be a wallflower and pick up like this little nugget of something. I feel that was really inspiring to be able to hit all of these other people and sort of be a way to work with that funneling idea and have a pre-screen all at the same time, but still get people to come to your uh, thing to your get, funneled into your business. So it's really interesting to, to, you know, I can definitely identify with that feeling that lack of energy from top, you know, being in the digital space, but there, there are demonstration, we're in a demonstration of how that's um, actually successful. So it's really, it seems like a mindset shifting to me, but I'm still struggling with it too. You know, yeah, we make, no. Exactly. I mean, I would, I'm willing to try it just because I might be totally wrong. You know, I'm totally willing to try it. Um, but right this minute, I mean, that's, it's kind of in the future. Like I've decided already, I'm like this, this course is, is like still like a tsunami coming out of fire hose. You know, I feel totally blown away by it. And I'm having a lot of anxiety too. Like I have to, um, you know, uh, Willow's going to start Willow, Tim and, um, Deirdre are going to start a trauma support group this week, thank God, because I'm really experiencing like a lot of um, different weird feelings from being back in school again, you know, like, and just by um, watching the John Taylor Gatto uh, videos and stuff, it just brought up all this crap from when I went to school, um, bullying and all this crap. So it's like, I'm dealing with all that. And so I'm just like, you know what, I'm really not going to put this pressure on myself to come up with something this time. I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm going to just do it again and do it again and do it again until, you know, whatever is supposed to come out of me finally comes out. Um, so I'm like, I mean, I was, I'm happy to say that I actually started an actual oil painting, which I haven't done for maybe like five years, like a real actual painting that I don't intend to show anybody. I'm like, yippee, I don't have to videotape this. I'm not doing that. I'm not gonna do that anymore, like right now, you know, because there was all this weird stuff um, about that where I was putting this incredible amount of pressure on myself to like film it and market it and do all this stuff. And it was like blocking me. So I'm just taking the pressure off. I'm just gonna deal with the stuff that's coming up, you know, and, uh, and trust that, you know, and, and try to develop these other skills, the support skills, and then trust that eventually something's going to form. And then, you know, I'm, be, I'm definitely open to, to maybe, you know, teaching some course and filming it to see if that would work eventually once I figure out how to do that. So does that make sense? Yeah, it's super awesome. I, my burning question is, uh, how many hours have you spent on that painting so far? And what do you feel like while you're, can you describe in words what you feel when you're, when you're painting that one? Oh, I've only spent, well, I mean, I did a, th I've done this totally differently from anything I've ever done before. Honestly, I did a photo collage, a digital photo collage, um, 
of a drawing that I had done that means a lot to me right now. It's kind of based on what I'm just told you uh, visually is uh, going on with me. Then I printed it out um, eight and a half by eight by 10 at a photo store. Um, and so I actually copied it onto a piece of wood that's like four feet by five feet or something like that. And I've sp spent probably only a couple of hours on it right now. I'm just blocking it in and I'm doing it in oil. So it's got to dry under coats have to dry. And I just feel free. Like I feel like, no, I'm probably not going to show this to anyone. I have taken a few pictures as I go. It's just for me to get back into that zone that I like to go to that I haven't been able to recapture for a long time. Because I mean, basically I was so upset by, um, and I love, don't get me wrong. I love Passio. I listened to all Passio stuff because I was getting bored and freaked out and like I couldn't do any artwork. And, but yet everything I learned was so intense that I, it almost blocked me more. And um, it, it has taken like about five years since then for me to actually just relax and say, okay, I'm just gonna do this painting now. That's it. I'm just gonna do this painting. I'm gonna do it this, way, this different way than I've ever done anything. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not really intending to show it. Of course I might change my mind and do all that, but yeah. Um, I'm not, like, you know, filming myself or anything, you know, while I'm doing it. I'm trying to take the pressure off to just experiment. And I'm hoping to, you know, literally do almost photorealism with parts of it because it's a photograph, so I can just copy it and it's mine. So, you know, hope that makes sounds sense. Like, yeah, it does. It sounds like an investment of time to get back to the source of, of joy from the artwork. Exactly. Yep. Jonathan, I saw you pop the video on a couple of times. Did you have a comment on the distractions? Well, actually, it wasn't on the distractions, but it's one I just wanted to, to share with uh, everybody. So uh, before I went to, away last year and before all of this COVID silliness, I, I used to do a lot of workshops with people, bringing disparate groups of people into the same location hosting with myself as an extrovert up the front in front of a whiteboard, having a few games and other things that we were going to do all related to the objectives that we were going to get through at the workshop. Usually it was around bringing people together, working as a team and understanding each other. Now in this post COVID environment and me working from home and needing to work on projects globally, everybody's in different locations and so that's the first benefit that I want to advertise for everybody if you are going to now do your courses and do presentations and things online you, you no longer are restricted geographically you can really reach out the entire world and if you put it on record people can come back and watch it you're going across time zones which is is great the second thing that I wanted to say for everybody is that the um, energy that uh, I used to take away as an extrovert from having all those people together is really, really different. You, you do have to enjoy standing up and talking to people. That is uh, uh, something that I enjoy doing. So uh, there that's same, but I don't get the same energy feel. But once you accept that and become used to it, it's a little bit easier to maintain. And one of the great things about having these online and virtual ones uh, that I've done is at the end of it, and ones I've even been a participant in, is everybody's always very thankful, very polite, just of that opportunity to come together virtually and share the experience with others, which is absolutely brilliant because we're all socially distant at the moment now, not just the six feet, two meters or whatever, but because we're not interacting as much, it's, it's really having an effect. So people are really enjoying the opportunity to come together in virtual communities. And my third point is that what you used to do with everybody in the room, you can substitute it for, for new activities that you do do online. There's plenty of programs there, Miro for virtual whiteboards or whiteboard itself if you use Microsoft and all these other things that you can set up your template, your framework, just as I used to have hand cards or butcher's paper and uh, whiteboard markers there. You just switch to the new virtual ones. And the brilliant thing is with these virtual ones, once they're set up, 
They just take little refinements and I can use them again and again and again. So it's the same, but it's also different. So I just wanted to give Joanna and the, the rest of the people my experience and give you as well some, some confidence. So that was a real scarcity mindset for me. How on earth am I going to change all my experience to now delivering in this virtual world? And I've had to get on with it. And by getting on with it, I found actually it wasn't as scary as I thought. Yeah, it does sound, I mean, I think, you know, Joanna and I were both like feeling the whole having operated in real life environments and thriving in those spaces, it seems like we were both kind of on that page and, and identifying that. And I feel like it's overwhelming to jump into this uh, online world. This is the first online anything I've ever done, online course, online group, online meeting of anybody. It's all been with this community. I'm actually really grateful for that because I feel like the topics that I've been coming up that have been coming up for me are not, not even, I can't even breach them with the closest of my friends who I thought were ready for them and they're totally not. Um, so it, it, that, but it does. Yeah. I feel like, um, you know, maybe the resistance is where, you know, that Joanna was speaking about is that how you had said that, that you could make this digital whiteboard, right? And then it just, or a, an asset, and then it just requires like a little bit of refinement here and there. And it reminded me of how Joanna had said becoming, using art as a artwork, as a form of income becomes like a factory. And that's like the fear of the artist, right? Is to become the machine. And so maybe that's especially difficult for a difficult uh, obstacle for the art artist mind did and artist hearted people to to overcome within this world but at the same time it is really interesting because of you know again back to those comments with the jordan page how many people you could spark you could you can find a way to be authentic with your artwork through the digital environment and world and maybe spark way more people than you ever may have encountered in in the real world because you know especially now but we don't know what it'll be like in the future but even still even take away lockdowns and any covid stuff about it the you know, you know i live in a very liberal uh town where a lot of people are trying to be back to the land that they've never been to before and be farmers and everything and it feels like you're uh you're going into a crowded place and screaming the same thing you know, in a slightly different tone than everybody else. And it's difficult. So to, to feel like you can even do it there. So maybe here it's easier to funnel those people in because you can be more focused. And once you've got the thing, it doesn't require constant repetition as, as big of a constant overhaul. Yeah. And, but I mean, the thing about it is it's not a whiteboard, you know, it's pieces of paper and temper paint and sloppiness and you have to I think it's got to there's gonna have to be something with multiple cameras and I don't know it's it's a little overwhelming right now I'm gonna just uh, put it on the back hey, though, the Joanna moment. it sounds like you're already thinking about it you're already as TJ said chipping oh, away brat. you're a brat <laughs> you're a brat I swear I'm gonna have to schedule another appointment with you <laughs> you're so funny uh. well uh jonathan while i got you yeah. on i want to i want to go back to the uh the integration exercise that you were talking about you said you had done uh one of the blueprint calls this week and you role played did you do the role play from the you you uh, led the blueprint call is that accurate Yes, that's right. So uh, I, after coming on to the Q&A last week and asking about me feeling behind, I, I charged through. Actually, I, I listened to all of season, uh, sorry, uh, of week eight, uh, finished up uh, last night. And how I jammed it all in was uh, listening at one and a half times the speed. But as well as uh, trying to do that, I made sure I, I booked a few interview calls in with people at different stages of the uh, the call. Uh, so of the course 
So I was able to have people practice their, their week three interview on me and keeping up their own personal interview skills. So that was great. That really reaffirmed my why and what I was getting out of the course as well. But I also did the, the week eight as the interviewer and uh, that was brilliant. You know, shout out to Joanna. I had a really great chat with her. Michael, Ed, Carl, Amy, all these people are really great. So if you haven't had the chat chance to chat to them, I, I highly recommend it. The great things that uh, I found about switching the uh, the the mindset from doing it as a, your week three, get to know you, you know, do I want to work more with this person? Then what do we have in common? Was a not an easy switch actually it was a little bit harder i found myself regressing in my interview skills and needing to rely on my my pre-planned notes a little bit more so that was really good that again it introduced the overwhelm uh, as well um, richard's emphasis on the pareto principle that was really key that i had to be quiet unlike what i'm doing now i really had to be succinct so that was uh, a good test for my own development and I had to become a better listener. I really had to listen for people's keys, their pain points, as well as what were their expectations. And in a couple of them, it was really interesting to work out actually their expectations were too low. And that autonomy with a little bit of questioning and the, the like, people quickly came to realize you know, that they could expect more. And that was a, a brilliant thing for really positive feedback for me and testing me to to catch that the pain point that they could address or catch that uh, expectation and, and then be able to take it further. So it was really fun. Awesome. What did you did you have any experience remembering the difference of being the person delivering the call and and when you had your first blueprint call like how you've grown in that time and what what uh reflections you had on who you were when you took that call oh yes as um has come out amongst all of us uh so many more ideas uh, are coming through now and uh, i think it's partly because of a little bit more organization and brain space so uh, that's allowed me to to think of more things that i can do uh, Joanna was really pushing me hard on, on one of the areas and ideas that she latched onto and really thought I should uh, develop that. So that was a really good nudge forward that I have to uh, take and develop on that. The uh, other thing that I had to, for me, it was uh, actually chatting with other people and being a lot more of uh, it's about them and how I can help them and actually how I can help them can funnily enough often be, be monetized. Uh, but altruistically, um, as, as Richard said, you know, if I can provide somebody with 10 times the value of what I can do for them, that's a good thing. And, and that was another thing for me to aim for of not just can I help you, but can I really, really, really help you so that it's going to be truly worth your while? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big thing. I had a lot of that at the, uh, you know, realizing that at the farmer's market, I brought some funky uh, wild medicinal mushrooms with me to yeah. get some attention. And, you know, how many people, you know, it, it, how many people ask the right questions to, was it just curiosity or were they actually going to, you know, did they want to just buy it? I didn't have a price tag on those. I wasn't going to sell them. Um, they were a little bit too rough. I more wanted people to ask, where can I find those? How can I go be self-sufficient? And only a couple people went far enough down that, that path or showed that kind of interest. Uh, and when I maybe said something, they, they answered in a way that suggested they wanted to know more, but yeah, that providing the value, what's the fish in the fishing pole idea, right? Um, so that's pretty, pretty exciting. What was your biggest challenge about, um, or, you know, you, it seems like you've said that being succinct and being able to listen better is one of the things that you're working on the hardest. Yeah, those I think were successes that I, I came out during the, the week. So that was good. What I want to work on in this week coming is much more about uh, my note taking and being able to hold or formulate first a plan for people's next steps and then be able to hold them to that. 
something else that I'm looking forward to uh, to doing with other people as well, because we've all signed up for autonomy, is looking at their initial either rejections or constraints. You know, do they truly see the value? You know, is it the price the val uh, that they they're going to that they were thinking of their own cash flows and that. So I'm looking forward to uh, some hard ones that are going to sort of tap me and challenge me to bring out again how much extra value can be done and what way that I can problem solve with this person so that they receive the whole value. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting and uh, a big skill to remember my blueprint call with Lisa and to be coming up against these ideas where, you know, I thought I wanted to be farming because it would free me from the, uh, the golden handcuffs, wage slavery idea. But then I realized through that, that it's not going to be this exponential th The way I was thinking was maybe how you were saying aiming too low. Right. And I realized that it wasn't much different than trading time for money because it wasn't going to be offering high enough value to get a high enough ticket back. And, and it was really, incredible to be going through these problems, maybe discovering them for myself the first time and to be able to hear somebody who's doing that call, being asking the right questions and being able to formulate, being note-taking and coming right back with these questions that are furthering that along. Um, it, was, it was an incredible experience on that end. So it feels exciting to get to be on the other end of that. Brilliant. Brilliant. And for your own, you know, 19 skills and your autonomy introduction call, do you, do you actually feel that you can now go back to that resource and actually tick some of it off, but increase it even more? Do I personally feel that? I, yes. I feel like I'm, you know, the thermometer level is raising in some of them, but not all of them. And that I have I will, you know, have a long ways to go in anything and that they maybe will never be full. Like maybe they'll, it'll be like a Dungeons and Dragons like thing where it gets full and then it goes all the way back down because I have to do the next level of that skill. <laughs> very good. Well, I did have a, a chat with Justin this week and he's uh, very good if anybody hasn't spoken to him yet. Uh, I was surprised at his, his youth actually because his maturity. I even asked him again whereabouts he was from because I know uh, our consultancy firm in the US is, is hiring. So uh, <laughs> it was um, he was one there who was uh, describing and that the vessel, you know, it truly does get bigger. So as you were describing the thermometer, as that's rising, you know, we all through this course are actually becoming not just a cup or a bucket, becoming the bathtub. And I'm looking for as it's all expanding to the swimming pool and these great lakes eventually, you know, as our whole perspective just continues and uh, our, our realization truly gets rid of the scarcity mindsets and the infinite potential that we all have. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Jonathan. Anybody else want to comment on if they've done that or uh, anybody who was in those calls with Jonathan or anybody want to talk about doing the blueprint calls that's been on a past season? I will say that working with Jonathan was amazing and I'm going to call him back again. It was fun. Uh, <clears throat> that's a good testimonial. Although he was very intimidated, I was pretty intimidated to begin with, but it was, it was, it turned out to be a lot more, not, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be like. So I'm going to definitely do it again. Awesome. Um, yeah, this week I, I, I'll touch on the exercises or the things that I did this week that were really um, exciting for me. I was able to be a participating guest speaker with Amy's uh, Free Thinking Kids course. And that was real enlightening and fun to figure out how to, um, you know, I have children, so I'm pretty used to communicating with children, but it was also my first time really presenting anything that I am into that I practice to some children who are a little bit 
uh, older than my children, keeping engagement up. And that felt really exciting to have to be able to switch on the spot. Amy super helped me out in the tech space, being able to, she had a video pulled up that really drove the conversation right away. Um, that was really helpful, but it was really, it's been really great to continue to refine the public speaking skills. I've been really appreciative of that. I also was pretty excited to uh, the one other interview that I did this week was with Owen, AKA Bootsy Greenwood. And that was pretty fun. Um, and that was an interesting one because I sort of, you know, I hadn't known this person, but I had a pretty good conversation with uh, Lee a couple weeks back. And he had mentioned that uh, Owen has his own course and it was really exciting to get to talk to somebody who had developed a course and went through these opportunities and had gone through autonomy as well and how that refined it it sounded like he had the course before autonomy and it was exciting to interview somebody who's on the other side of it and doing these things and the types of tips and the types of things that they were thinking about and i really felt like i was at this well and there was based on the right amount of listening the right amount of questions being super attentive, the more information that I was able to get. And that was really, really helpful to get a little bit more direction on where to take these ideas that I have when they come up for developing my own content and my own courses from the nuts and bolts of how to get email people from where to do funding or how to pre-sell and do different things. The idea of selling coming up with your low ticket item first or your high ticket item and how to refine those and keep them keep adding value to them so that they're not just stagnant um that was that was pretty pretty great for me so yeah i feel really excited to keep moving forward with the the next week and working on closing um i am definitely struggling at the the market to be closing with people it was it was interesting this was my first week of farmers markets working on these skills in a different mindset with people and i felt like i was kind of in my head a little bit too much trying to get people's attention and and uh, wondering what was going on there were a lot more people than i expected a lot less questions getting people drawn in was was difficult in that space and i felt myself running through the um, the, the gamut of the autonomy skills while interacting with all these people. And that was, that was helpful. And I look forward to refining them more so that I can start being a little more confident about the bigger ticket items at the farmer's market table, like, um, you know, yearly subscriptions or six month CSA shares, something a little bit bigger, how I can convince people to add value there or that there is value there and get them understanding what that, what it is that they're investing in. Um, these skills are also really have been helpful. I have a pretty big interview coming up this week, it got rained out last week for a land stewardship position. And I feel like these integration exercises are just invaluable. I think uh, in week eight, the sales and closing lecture, Richard said something about how in any conversation, even with children, somebody's buying and somebody's selling. And if you're buying their uh, their excuses and leaving, then shame on you, or maybe you should think about it a little bit more. Anybody else want to comment on their week? What's coming up for them? What they've been doing? Anybody attend any of the extracurricular activities? Did anybody here hop into Tony's course on logic uh, regarding early education? I wasn't able to get there. I'm really looking forward to a replay. I'll, I'll chime in, Jeffrey, if you want. Sure. A uh, couple things that uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, I, I did get a chance to talk to, to uh, Jonathan and uh, I, I'm really, you know, as a season two person, it is really fun to participate in the new seasons, in my opinion, because it is one in which, uh, you know, I get to see this uh, community developing 
And, uh, you know, I, I do feel like we, our awareness is growing as we get to the point that we get, you know, we get to interact with each other and know, uh, you know, a bit more about a lot of different things from a lot of different perspectives. It really does demonstrate, you know, something that we've been, you know, we've been steered away from. And that is that collaborative uh, environment that community can be. I think we're just scratching the surface of what is going to be a much greater uh, awareness. And, and certainly, you know, I think an ability to, uh, you know, become non-fragile in a very fragile world. Uh, I, I think that that's what we're, uh, that's what we're, uh, you know, doing in this community. And, uh, you know, I'm just excited to see the people that are really participating you know, is, is growing and they're, they're having a, a positive experience. Again, I think, I think we've got a lot of, a lot of ways to go. I'm, I'm still realizing, you know, my potential. And uh, I spend a lot of time, you know, I've got my own course, Ethical Emergence, which uh, I've got a, a real uh, positive opportunity to connect with a lot of the people that are involved with autonomy. And I can say that uh, getting to know them well is, uh, is an incredible experience, you know, and I, I feel so much more, you know, uh, Richard says, you know, your net worth is tied to your network. I just feel like, you know, this is the network that just unleashes it all, you know, it's not just the quality, not just the, uh, you know, prosperity, but quality of life is greatly increased you know, when it, when it comes to being introduced to all the potential that's out there, that all the solutions that we have, that we can bring to the table for each other, it's, uh, it's tremendous. But I did talk to Jonathan in the past week or two, and uh, uh, I, I did have an opportunity to interview Amy for my leadership ethics and organization interview series that I'm doing on Wednesdays. And uh, that was uh, incredible because I did get to witness her uh, webinar too. And really what she's bringing to the table as far as opening the minds of children to, uh, you know, just understanding how to be skeptical, how to be curious. You know, a lot of the things that Gatto uh, have, have, you know, has touched on and, and, you know, has demonstrated in a lot of his, his presentations but, uh, you know, to see somebody doing it in real time, and uh, that's, that's really exciting. And, you know, I, I did participate in one of her uh, free thinking calls as well. And, uh, you know, I thought it was spectacular. <clears throat> so I, 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 see a lot of, uh, I see a lot of opportunity in this, in this uh, community, and I see the, the growing nature of what we're doing. Uh, I, I see the engagement increasing and uh, I see people starting to see the benefits of what that might mean for their future. They start to see, you know, the possibilities of what they can, in, you know, the, what they can actually do to impact the world is, uh, you know, tremendous. Yeah, that's really well said, Michael. Thanks for for sharing that it does really the uh, anti-fragile feels really important and it feels like it's going to take a special uh, type of people to really step up to the plate to help more people become anti-fragile and it's uh, definitely encouraging to see all of the students who have been in the course still interacting very regularly I see you on Q and A's and uh, on these do it lives almost every week, I feel like, and it's really awesome to, uh, to see how that is there, how people are, are really showing up for the community. And that was, you know, that was one of Owen's biggest things in our conversation that he said is the most invaluable thing for him of this whole course was the community that comes with it. Not only does it give you this uh, recalibration on your reality binoculars, but it also helps you have this network of people who are, have gone through a obstacle course, a bigger, ob the bigger obstacle course and, and do have the integrity to show up. 
Yeah, it does make a big difference. And, I, you know, I think that's one of the things, well, that, you know, I don't know. Have you ever heard of the concept of Wetiko? It's the kind of the no. Native Americans terminology for, uh, you know, a couple other people have uh, mentioned it over the years. Uh, Carlos Castaneda's and, and uh, I think Carl Jung calls it uh, archons. But the idea that uh, there's a psycho-spiritual kind of virus that's invading the minds of, of society. And to some degree, it's, it's this self-destructive nature that, uh, you know, is apparent in what would be called aberrant behavior. You know, our inability to communicate with other people uh, kind of relegates itself to bad behavior, you know, if we can't communicate properly. And so uh, in being able to kind of identify and spend a little bit more time observing and listening to people, you get a, you get a better sense of how people's words are contradictory to their actions in some cases. And when that's the case, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a clue to what's going on, you know, with them, with their past and, uh, you know, how they, how they think and view themselves. And, uh, you know, this is what the, the Indians and, you know, quite a few other uh, kind of ancient cultures described as this, uh, you know, like never ending battle <clears throat> that actually isn't really a battle at all. It's, it's actually something that we have to go through, you know, that it, this is the indicator of how we uh, overcome uh, you know, the, the problem that like steers us towards evolving to a better, uh, you know, a better end because we understand the problem. We, we solve it. That's kind of our nature. <clears throat> so it's, it's, I think it's an interesting time. And I think, uh, you know, we have this, I think we have this opportunity in front of us to, uh, you know, to grow awareness of each other and, uh, and really have compassion for each other too, you know, because I, I think it's really important when, when, you know, like this is, this is kind of one of the things that I'm doing. I, I'm playing the role of, you know, seeing the potential that comes in the door every day and saying, ah, oh, welcome, you know, <laughs> hey, we need that, you know, we need your expertise. Did you get to see such and such? Talk to him. Maybe we can put a collective together or cooperative or, you know, uh, that's kind of uh, what I'm seeing. And, uh, you know, so I want to, you know, I want to be here to like welcome people and, uh, you know, encourage them to be involved because I, I do think that uh, what we've put together with Autonomy Unlimited, you know, a marketing and consulting company is one in which every time we see an entrepreneur, there's an opportunity for us to work together to be a success all the way around, you know? And so every, every one of the, the people in autonomy that have great ideas, let's bring them up, you know, let's have a discussion about them, you know, let's, let's start making them happen because we've got the, we've got the ability to do that. Yeah, it does really seem like that's, you know, we're cultivating ourselves to become closer to our higher best self through the lens of sales and, and education based things and listening and all of these essential skills that we have access to once we start identifying them. And it really seems like we have that we're, you know, there's a group of people being cultivated in a way to help other people consistently show up, consistently develop more and more integrity and help identify the people who are ready to do that, do that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 there's there's Amy. Let's uh, let's hear from her. <laughs> I just want to thank you guys both um, for coming on this week because uh, the kids really loved it. <laughs> I know. I think I have a bit of a slow signal here, so it's a bit disjointed on my side, but. Yeah, you guys did so good. Um, not many people know how to talk to kids. And I find like, you know, there's times where I have to like interject and, 
and that sort of thing. But they were really engaged by both of you. And <laughs> it was really funny. Mike got some feedback that, you know what, the oldest boy, he was like, I got one word for you, Mike, badass. <laughs> <laughs> and they're both interested like they're all interested in having you guys come back and just what you were talking about Jeffrey with um what's happening with this cultivation here when you guys uh come on you're passing that on to the kids too because they're seeing that like they're that's the thing that like they, we've talked about their passion projects and then you show interest in that and you don't even have to like assign homework or something because they want to do it because they want to share and connect. And they, they're they much like, um, when I asked these kids what they wanted to do, it was much like the responses I got from our first like integration calls with interviews. Because I would ask the kids, well, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? How are you going to make it happen? And at the essence of that, what they wanted to do was something that opened up life for them, that it was challenging and it was fun. And it also helped their family and their community at the same time so they're they're trying to figure it out you know I got 13 and 11 year olds and then seven and eight year olds. sorry that was my side froze <laughs> but yeah um, the kids are like really very much on the same page as the adults and it's fun to bring the ages together and see that interplay and change up. So thank you anyways for coming on. It was really enjoyable for us. Well, it was truly an honor for me. Sorry, I don't need to walk over anybody. <laughs> Go ahead, try again, Michael. Uh, I was just gonna say it's, it was truly an honor. And I really, uh, you know, I really enjoyed the opportunity. I, I thought that was, you know, again, I, I really appreciate what you're doing because it is like what Gatto, you know, carrying on Gatto's, uh, you know, legacy, really, I think. And to me, that's, uh, you know, just such an honorable thing to do. Yeah, Much it's respect. really, it's really interesting and fun to be doing those courses with children and, and, you know, realizing that they have just as much potential as anybody else. And if they're nurtured in a way that um, they can make those decisions and learn how to think freely and, and be supported in that growth and have like uh, the bumpers on the bowling lane up more often so that they can feel a little bit safer to do those, those types of things that aren't really being taught. And if they, you know, they just, there's so much, opportunity to share with them and you know we're if we're not doing this with them in mind whatever we're doing with the next generations in mind there's really not a reason to be to be doing it right because they're going to inherit whatever we do uh, just like we inherited the world that we're in now so i find it extra important to be focusing on on those adventures and you know i feel like as uh, jonathan had brought up with the whole shooting too low thing it wasn't until i realized that i was shooting too low in trying to make a business that i could just provide for myself but how can i teach other people to have this really important skill that the world's going to need forever and if we don't grow food in a, in a, in the right ways we it it becomes unhealthy it becomes destructive it becomes just profits so it's really uh, exciting to be sharing those things with those next generations i also want to mention too how much i love um everybody here in autonomy doing like taking action to do what they want to see in the world and there's a group i formed here uh, in the atlantic provinces in canada and with the movement that I want to bring about when I world, um, the key takeaway I had from that was that we, each of us have to live what we want to see in the world, because if we don't, it doesn't exist. So with everybody doing their own thing, it's amazing then, because you get to see 
what these people want in their life and have it manifested. You're actually taking the actions to bring it about. And it's really fascinating. So, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I have always hung on to this uh, John Paul Sartre quote about um, a man's or person's argument for existence is the way that they live their life. And if you don't choose to live it in a way that is meaningful and productive, then I guess maybe you're arguing for uh, being coddled by the distractions. Well, if I can interject there, I would just say that's, you know, that's that, that aberrant behavior. It's that, uh, you know, behavior that's, um, you know, incongruent with their, with our own benefits. You know, we, we have been going in the wrong direction because we've been kind of, uh, you know, chasing an illusion that, uh, you know, we don't have to take responsibility for our lives. And the, the reality is, is that that's, exactly it's exactly the opposite and even and when we do take responsibility for our lives we get a great deal of power you know we get a great deal of influence that we can affect other people in such a positive way it just seems very odd that we don't you know we don't recognize that we 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 haven't visited that we haven't practiced that on a daily basis because it seems like it would be such you know, so obvious, but it's, you know, we've been chasing an illusion for so long that, uh, you know, and I, I think that kind of goes into the idea of that with Tico, you know, we're just, <clears throat> we're enamored by this idea that, you know, everybody can do everything else for us and we can just, you know, relax and enjoy the show. But the reality is, is it's our show. We've got to be, <laughs> We've got to be the ones that are the actors, and but it's amazing how much influence we have. You know, if we really put our minds to it and start, uh, you know, taking responsibility for the relationships of the people around us and how we, you know, how we communicate more accurately so that they understand who we are and we understand who they are, because that's really where, you know, value is created. Value is created in transactions. And it doesn't necessarily have to be money. It can be anything of value, but we all have value and exchanging it in a, in a community means that, you know, we can come up with some kind of medium of exchange, but the, the bottom line is, is that we value each other's contribution to it. You know, we see that that's, you know, it helps. But in any case, uh, you know, I see TJ is on the call, and uh, I know Jonathan is a, a project management uh, guru to some degree. In my mind, in my opinion, I think he's, uh, you know, extremely uh, well positioned professional to say the least. But uh, I've been I've been dreaming up this idea of having project management a project management team, and I, I think TJ is also on that on that uh, vision and uh, you know i just want to see people succeed so like creating the circumstance where we can demonstrate our skills with project management for people that have ideas and want to see them actually happen let's let's get together you know let's get that let's get that uh, ball rolling that's enough Excellent, <laughs> excellent offer to put out there and, and way to support the community, Michael. Thank you for, on behalf of everyone who hasn't heard that yet. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's just one example of the talents that we have here. You know, I mean, we're just starting to scratch the surface if you ask me, but uh, that's definitely one that I think, you know, having people that know how to take ideas and turn them into reality help other people that have ideas it's just it seems like it's a no-brainer but uh that's what we can bring to the table and i know there's many more behind them that are just as talented and uh you know have some ambition and once once they see it in action uh we are going to start to realize 
the abundance mindset that uh, we're sharing in. Anybody else want to chime in with any thing from their, their week? I'll go. How's it going, Jeffrey? Hey, Danny, it's going pretty good. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. You're doing a great uh, job on hosting this week's uh, uh, Do It Live. I just wanted to say that. Thanks, um, Danny. Oh, yeah. No, you're doing awesome. Um, so I got a story. It kind of follows up on Michael's uh, uh, I was in a call with him uh, with ECI development uh, about 10 days ago or whatnot. So I, I'm doing the down payment on a property in Nicaragua. And so uh, um, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the possibility of moving uh, down there. And so I couldn't pass it up. Um, but I was talking to a friend of mine that I've seen in maybe five, six years. We were talking about logistics or how was I going to get all my stuff down to uh, Nicaragua. And out of that conversation, uh, I was offered an opportunity and I don't think I would have gotten the offer if I didn't take a time. Uh, I, I tie one into the other. It just, uh, just during the course of that conversation, I was like, well, well it doesn't matter if you're going to Nicaragua. I, I, you could do something for my organization. Uh, so you don't mind me doing this through Zoom calls and remote. Danny, I know you'll figure it out. <laughs> So I go freely to Nicaragua. I don't have to worry about, oh, is there a job? Well, I've got two careers anyway. So, uh, but the opportunity to do this remotely on my schedule, um, hey, how do you say no to that? So, uh, um, you know, the world's going to keep spinning and, you know, I can elect to do the things that I'm doing here in New Mexico or the new opportunity in Nicaragua. So I know that's a good uh, eight or nine months away, but I'm excited about it. And uh, uh, life is good. And uh, um, uh, you know, you can always get something out of this course. Um, and I think one of the things that powered me through the week was my network. Uh, I, I had a network before I got into Atomic. Now that I've done the courses and, and put the role playing and everything together, I still have that same network. But the interaction's different. People picked up on it right, uh, right away. That's like, well, wait a minute. What did you learn in autonomy? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> that's an opportunity to recruit people for the course. Also to give them an idea of just what skill sets people are really looking for. And uh, if, if you really watch those slides from last night, when you use these keywords and you're talking about the copywriting, talking about website development, uh, sales development, uh, it's there. People are looking for this stuff. And so uh, you're able to bring greater utility, not only in new customers, new clientele, but people you already know. Uh, so uh, have at it, you know, have some fun out there. And, and uh, no, Michael, that was a great call you hosted last week. <laughs> that logistical call actually transpired out of that one zoom call so you might not see the effects right away but as you go through your daily activities you just don't know uh, i know what we talk about knocking on the door for opportunity well the reality of it is opportunity is knocking on the door looking for you too so uh, this all comes together um and uh about this time last season i had the overwhelm feeling as well and, and what got me through that was just the opportunities never stopped coming in. So it was like, okay, well, what, how I got past that, uh, I had to look at all the dead weight that was around. It was like, okay, what do I need to get rid of to accommodate all this opportunity, all the new people that I'm hanging out with? How do I accommodate all that? So um, that was just the way I contended with it. Um, the opportunity hasn't stopped since then. Um, and it just, I didn't even plan on that. So, so uh, uh, in regards to farming, you know, I'm here in the greenhouse now. I'm going to shoot a couple of videos. I've got uh, interviews I'm doing next week. And ironically, it's interviews I wanted to do with certain people over the last couple of years. Just the opportunities never came about. Now with this, 
now the city of Albuquerque is not going to adore want to interview uh, the, the New Mexico Department of Health wants to interview. And so these people are now coming in. Well, I think now with my experience through autonomy and the way I present things now, now it's of more utility to uh, these other entities. And so, yeah, now it's time to have that conversation. Uh, so uh, with your travels, with the, with the uh, farmer's market, you, you, you're going to do great there. Um, and it's just one, it's one feather in the feather cap. And so uh, uh, I'm excited for what you're about to do. Yeah, it's definitely, there's opportunities and, you know, through Michael talking and, and you talking, uh, I was trying uh, not to get too distracted in my own thoughts, but something that came up was that I realized that one of my customers or potential clients was actually one of the other farmers there who came up and was checking out my stuff and asked a couple of questions. And I was able to ask him some questions to realize what he was going through. And I identified some of the struggles that he was having by some of the comments he made. And, you know, I put that offer out there like, Hey, if you want to figure out, uh, you want to set up a time and we could talk about that idea and, and we'll hash it out. And then, you know, um, come up with some kind of value that I can add. And at worst, it becomes a practice interview in real life for, um, you know, cultivate, helping farmers cultivate themselves and becoming better and expanding. You know, there's a lot of merit to that. Uh, just to give you a comparison to what's going on in New Mexico, uh, the average age of a farmer here is 71. Uh, there is no next generation farmer here. Um, so it's two dynamics play. The other one is the average income of those farmers is around $10,000 a year. That is not going to attract the next generation farmer. So knowing these things and knowing this group here, how do we solve those challenges? And so through various methods, but through the networking and solving other people's uh, challenges and problems, now the opportunities are there. And so... Uh, when people say, oh, you're not going to make any money doing farming. Well, you know, <laughs> um, you, you can say that today all you want. Uh, opportunities are here. Yeah, they are. It just depends on uh, what type of uh, lens we want to look at, at them through and how we want to see them. I think mm -hmm. uh, there was a interview with Brian Rose of London Real and a high ticket sales guy that I'm blanking on the name at the end of week eight's lecture. Um, and he was talking about when you ask for something, it shows up, but you just might not recognize who it is. Cardone, is that Cardone? That sounds familiar. Um, but it just, you know, it just gave that idea of uh, there's, it's all, and it's just like the same as me. If I'm trying so hard to sell to some customers who don't want to buy expensive lettuce that I miss the bigger ticket item of helping a farmer develop his um, potential, then I, I failed in, in failing to realize that that was another opportunity it just shows up in a different, different form. Indeed. Yeah. That's definitely something that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you guys are observing and certainly, Danny, what you're talking about as well, you know, there's just a never ending stream of opportunities popping up every day. Every time we uh, communicate with somebody else, every time we interview somebody, it's us being able to connect our network and knowledge to their network and knowledge and examine what the problems could potentially be, as well as what are the potential solutions. And uh, man, I just, there's just so many solutions in this group. Uh, it's just, it's, it's really fascinating, fabulous. You know, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be a part of. Second that for sure. I'm excited for this group every day. <laughs> it doesn't cease to amaze me anymore. I just, I just roll with it. Well, everybody, I am running out of time because I have another uh, farming. I got to go pick up some new rabbits for our 
for our group. Does anybody else have anything that they want to burning up there that they want to get in before we close out the do it live podcast for this week? All right. Well, I want to say thanks to everybody who showed up and who's continuing to show up. It's always inspiring to see people in the dojo. And even when I'm not able to get in there and be doing the exercises, I'm super grateful for the time that I am able to and the support that I receive. And I am really inspired to see everybody putting in what they're putting in and continuing to uh, draw from the well when they need the drinks. And it's, uh, it's really great to be a part of this community. So thanks everybody. Thanks for coming and have an awesome rest of your weekend. We'll see you tomorrow at the live Q&A. I'll go ahead and shut it down, Jeffrey. Have awesome. Have a good day. Thank you so much for the support, Joshua. Later. <laughs> Bye.